Now let's look at the equation to determine the vertical gravity due to a sphere at point P. So in the diagram below you can see this buried sphere with a radius of A and the depth from C which is directly above the sphere to the center of the sphere is Z and then point P is a distance X away from C and the distance from point P to the center of the sphere is R and then theta is the angle between the vertical and this line R. And we want to calculate the vertical gravity at this point P. Now the gravity at a point due to a buried body is the gravitational constant times by the change in M due to this buried body divided by R squared. And well, previously we've dealt with a point directly above the body so we've previously been looking at C and in that case, R is the same as Z, because we're directly above the body. But now, because we're starting to look at points other than vertically above the body, we're introducing this R value. Now, previously we said mass is equal to volume times density, and since we're dealing with a sphere, the volume of a sphere is 4 over 3 pi a cubed. And so we substitute this back into our original equation, and therefore the change in G at a point due to a buried sphere is equal to gravitational constant over r squared times 4 over 3 pi a cubed times by the change in density. And so this change in density is the difference between the density of the sphere and the density of the surrounding material. Now we want to calculate the vertical component of change in g at point P because when we're at point C directly above the object, this change in g is the vertical component of gravity because it's directly above the object so it's pointing directly down. The attraction is between C and this buried sphere. But as you start to move away you get a horizontal component as well. But we're not interested in this horizontal component, we only want the vertical component. And so that's why it has become change in G times the cos of theta because of this angle theta. And Cos of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's why we've now got change in g's times z over r, because adjacent is z and r is the hypotenuse. And then you can substitute in here the change in g equation, and so it becomes a gravitational constant times 4 over 3 pi a cubed times the change in density times our z, and it now becomes over r cubed. But since r is equal to x squared plus z squared all square rooted, we can now substitute this back into the equation, and you get your final equation, which is 4 over 3 pi a cubed times the change in density times the gravitational constant times the depth over x squared plus z squared all to the 3 over 2. And it is this equation that we use to calculate the anomaly over a body that you would expect to measure in the field with the gravity meter. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this equation and we're going to use this example. So we've got a spherical cavity, it's really like a cave, and it's got a radius of 8 meters and its center is 50 meters below the surface. So let's draw a picture. Cavity, 50 meters below the surface, got a radius of 8 meters. If the cavity is full of water and is in a rock of depth that has a density of 2,400 kilograms per meter cubed, so this rock around here is 2,400 kilograms per meter cubed, and if you go back and look at that table we looked at the other day, the density of water, so this is all water, there's 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And what is the maximum size of the anomaly? We're not going to do that, I think we did it the other day. And we're now actually going to calculate the profile across it. So, are we expecting a positive anomaly or a negative anomaly? A negative anomaly, yes, because this body is got a lower density than the surrounding rock. So, what is the difference, this change in density between the two? You would say 1,400, but you'll see now, previously when you calculated, we were taking the density of the object minus this density, so now it's actually going to be minus 1,400 kilograms. And if that minus, that's going to give us that negative anomaly. The only other thing you've got to keep in mind is your x and your y's. 
this assumes that zero is over the bottom here. So you're going in that direction is going to be positive, and that direction is going to be negative for your x's. So we've just got to keep that in mind. We'll do it together. Open up Excel. So first thing to do is I find the easiest thing is to ha at the top have a, a few lines that say parameters. So the first thing is depth. What is the depth? We're dealing with 15. 15 meters depth. We had a radius of 8 meters and we've got a density contrast of minus 1,400 kilograms per meters cubed. So these are the things we know. Um, may I suggest you put your, your units in a different column. Don't put your units in the same column as your number. Have column D with your numbers and column C with your units. Next, we're going to do our row of X's. So X is the value along this profile. You should start at, let's start at minus 50 and go to positive 50. Going up in 10. So minus 50, minus 40, minus 30, minus 20. If you start typing a trend of numbers, all you have to do is highlight the numbers in Excel, go to this little black corner down here, click and drag, and it picks up what you're trying to do, and you drag it to where it needs to go, and it's done the rest for me. If you finish, try to put in this equation underneath here for GZ is equal to 4 over 3. Does everyone know how to do pi? In, um, you can type 3.14 or you can just type pi, open, open brackets, close brackets. But you must put a time. So times pi, open brackets, close brackets, times r. I'm actually going to go here. Cubed. Does everyone know how to do a cube? You have to do a little copy and a three. Times the density contrast and times G. I don't know what G is, I'll get it now. Times Z is the depth. Divided by X, which is minus 50. Squared plus Z squared, close brackets, to the power of 3 over 2. And I've got G here. Okay, I'll type it in. 6.67, 408 times 10 exponent minus 11. Oh, sorry. And I'm just going to put the units here so that we know I'm doing it right. S to the minus 2. Okay. So let's just look at this quickly. The 4 over 3 pi, we know that. B3 is my radius cubed, times by B4 is my density contrast, B5 is my G. So if you've typed in B5 here, you need to make sure you're putting this G value in B5. Times by B2, so B2 is the depth, then I'm dividing. So B6 is my x squared, plus b2 squared is my z squared, all to the power of 3 over 2. Copy it, control copy, highlight where you want to paste the values, and don't panic when you see the answer, and paste. Oh, all zeros. So can you see now what happened is in Excel, if I copy that thing and paste it here, all of the, the, the values I had in my equation here were b. Now because I'm shifting from column b to column c, it's changed all of them to c, and it's looking in C, and it's either got units or empty. So it's not finding these values again. How you make it always look at B is you put a dollar sign before the B, and that tells Excel don't change the column. Always look at column B. So if you quickly go back and put a dollar sign before all of your Bs, you won't run into this problem. And then copy and paste, and you should get D. Okay, so they look all the same. You highlight all of it and increase your decimal places. And you see they're all the same. But I know that did wrong. We are using B6 here, and we told it to keep B6. But 
we are not keeping 50 all the time. It should be changing. So that one B6 over there, take out that dollar sign. And now copy it again. Yeah, it's a B6. And paste it down, and they're slightly different. Okay, and does everyone know how to plot it on a graph? You literally, the easy, lazy way, just highlight all the values. Highlight, go to insert up at the top here, go to scatter, or whichever graph you prefer, click on it, and it will plot it. So that was how to calculate your anomaly, and you were right that this is negative. And that's because we've got that negative density value. Now, something to remember is that this value for GZ is in meters per second squared. So we actually want to convert it now into milligal. So let's create another row underneath it. And remember, we need to divide by 10 to the minus 5 to get it into milligal. So we go B7 divided by 10 exponent minus 5. And we'll copy it and drag it across. And so these values down here are in milligals. And so you can see all it does is serves to just give more m reasonable values for reading. So instead of uh, looking at times 10 to the minus 8, we've now got 0 0.002. And so let's actually alter that on our graph here. And so how you do that is you right click on the plotted area and go to select data. Then you go to Series 1, go to Edit, under Y Values. You can see it's currently looking at the Y Values from B7 to L7. So if I click on this red arrow here, it's showing me where it's taking it from. I'm now going to highlight these new values underneath. And I'm going to change my X values so that it actually takes into account these distances. And you can see it's changed it. So you can see now our y value is in milligals and our x values are the actual distances. And so that's why it's quite useful now to come and um, insert some axes so that you know what you're dealing with. So our x-axis, you could say distance, and it's good to put in units in meters. Enter. And our mm -hmm. y-axis, um, you can say vertical gravity component and it's in milligals. The last question to answer is if you had a gravity meter with a sensitivity of 0 0.04 would you be able to pick up this anomaly? And so it really just means that if your anomaly is bigger than 0 0.04 or negative 0 0.04 um, then you would be able to measure it. And so you can see here our anomaly goes as big as 0 0.09. So we would be able to pick up this anomaly.